Fair warning, the history of the body requires a relative level of explicitness. So today's episode is about syphilis. Syphilis is an STD and it has some pretty gruesome effects. So you may want to listen to this one um, where little or prudish ears cannot hear you. In other words, this episode is not safe for work. NSFW. I'm going to say NSFW. I just learned what that is. Yeah, it's not safe for work. Yeah. So now I use it a lot. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> unless your workplace is a hospital in which case that's you know probably par for the course and then maybe blast it over the loudspeakers the loudspeakers right exactly and then horrify all your patients <laughs> but at least they don't have syphilis probably so they can look forward to life without syphilis <laughs> Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. In 1496, Joseph Grunpeck, private secretary to the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I, was one of the first to write about a seemingly new disease that was ravaging the bodies of Europeans. The Roman tongue calls it the French evil, that which comes from Francis called scora from the word score, which is much talked about as impure, pimply, or stinking. It could be called thymius when the warts break open and the blood comes out of them, but when the warts are dry, it could be called condyloma. As I think upon the great misery, sorrow, fear, and need which we feel daily, with which the almighty, eternal God, even I admit it, punishes us every hour and every moment, I cannot hold back the tears. I find in the old histories and stories great plagues and punishments, which were laid upon the human race to account of their sins, great pestilences, shedding of blood, and famines. But they are indeed not to be compared with that which fills the present time in which we are now living." The French evil, the French disease, the great pox, what scholars today have identified as the conceptual precursor to syphilis, seemed to Europeans like Grunpeck to come out of nowhere. Already in 1496, just two years after the first documented epidemic of the disease in Europe, Grunpeck was so horrified by it that he wrote an entire treatise on the subject. He'd returned to it seven years later. If the disease acted the way it does now, it is likely Grunpeck in 1503 would have seen an even darker side to the great pox when he wrote, quote, Some are covered from the head to the knee with a rough scabies dotted with black and hideous lumps, which spares no part of the face except the eyes, the neck, the chest, or the pubis. They had become so filthy and repugnant that they hoped to die. Others, by contrast, moaned and wept and uttered heart-rending cries because of the ulceration of their male organs. Early modern Europeans hardly knew what to make of the French disease when it reached epidemic proportions at the end of the 15th century. 500 years later, scholars are just as baffled by the emergence of the disease in Europe at that precise historical moment. Today we're digging into the origins and earliest discussions of syphilis to find its historical debut and significance in the minds and ravaged genitals of early modern Europeans. I'm Avril Earls. And I'm Marissa Rhodes. And we are your historians for this episode of Dig. We want to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon supporters, but especially to our auger and excavator-level patrons, Colin, Eric, Peggy, and Laura, y'all rock, and your good faith and donations help keep this podcast going. Listener, if you are not yet a patron yourself, you can go to patreon.com slash digpodcast to learn more. Uh, Before we begin, I do want to say that there is a ton written on the history of syphilis, Medical doctors, paleopathologists, historians, paleobiologists, forensic anthropologists, comp literatureists, uh, just about every field I can think of that looks at the past in some way has its own angle on the syphilis discussion. I did my very best to read a decent sampling from each of these, but there was like no way I could even dent the field in its entirety in my lifetime, so let alone in the month or so I had to prepare this episode. 
It's actually a fascinating topic, and I tried to give this episode a decent blend of the medical, biological, and sociocultural historical sort of point of views. From the historian's point of view, the key issue at stake is not necessarily when the disease first plagued humankind, but how people remembered it, dealt with it, experienced it, etc., in specific moments and in the long durée of the disease. Kevin Sienna, I did a panel with him for Annie CBS that cool. was rejected. Oh, what? So I know it's crazy. So Kevin Sienna, editor of Sins of the Flesh, which includes essays covering just about every angle of thought about syphilis as a historical construct, points out pretty poignantly that syphilis was not syphilis as we know it until fairly recently. When it first emerged as an epidemic in Europe right around the end of the 15th century, it was not distinguished from other sexually transmitted diseases. It and diseases like gonorrhea were rolled into one and known simply as the venereal disease until the 18th century when physicians like William Cullen began differentiating it from the lesser venereal diseases. This complicates how we can and should think about syphilis as a historically contingent disease. The, quote, French pox, then, was not always or only the symptoms created by the bacteria that we've since discovered as having caused syphilis. And this point will be important to remember when we get deeper into the great origin debates. <laughs> that sounds... The great origin debates of syphilis! <laughs> um, so... The origin debates involve scholars from all of the aforementioned disciplines and probably more. Historians have, of course, had something to say about origins, even if they're not relying on carbon dated bones as evidence. The emphasis that scholars have placed on the first documented outbreak of syphilis during the Italian Wars of 1494 to 1496 and the intentional connection of that event with Columbus's return from the Americas is just one way that our discipline has been involved in the conversation. But there are also historians who are hesitant to even engage with the origin debate, insisting that our role in writing the history of syphilis is to query how people treated it, how they thought about it, how they talked about it, and their socio-medical legal responses to it, rather than trying to put a finger on patient zero. And That's there, like for the scientists yeah, to do. Right. right. And, and there are some really interesting parallels to the history of HIV AIDS in the 1980s and beyond, which we don't have time to get into here, but which others like Richard Davenport Hines and Claude Cattell have written on extensively and which we encourage you to look into. Uh, maybe, hopefully, that's a topic we can come back to in another episode in the distant future. Most agree that the conversation of origin is interesting. Was it the revenge of the colonized indigenous people in the Americas? Was it always present in Eurasia, but only distinguished from similar diseases starting in the 15th century? Or was it something entirely new, the result of peoples who'd not been in contact for hundreds or even thousands of years, finally converging in the Columbian exchange? But while interesting, these are not the core issues that historians tend to focus on when studying syphilis. For the most part, it's been the hard science-centered disciplines that have taken up those queries. The history of the debate is fascinating in and of itself. For decades, after Europeans started documenting and studying syphilis, they blamed each other for its emergence, Um, they blamed women and indigenous peoples of the Americas for its spread, and they moralized the disease itself from the first genital wart to the last breath of the decayed syphilitic body. Conversely, in a post-colonial world like today, an origin story which has the Europeans bringing syphilis to the Americas along with every other devastating epidemic ends up being sort of par for the course in the show of imperialism. So there are and always have been serious implications for discovering the origins of this disease. Right, because it it assigns culpability. Whose fault is this that this right. happened? Exactly. While the co-authors of articles like The Science Behind Pre-Columbian Evidence of Syphilis in Europe contend that modern debates about the origins of syphilis are not morally motivated the way they were when it was a blame game between European countries, even objective science is shaped by the scientists themselves. They decide what questions to ask, what tests to run, etc. Some scientists discuss their data as if it was above the flaws of humankind. But just as the humanities and social sciences, every scientist is part of her investigation and is subject to biases. That doesn't make results or interpretation of data sets less interesting or important. It's just important to be aware of. Don't be afraid to ask your own questions and to be skeptical, even of so-called experts. Exactly. 
In its earliest appearances in the historical record, the disease was just known as a great pox, or the French slash Italian slash German slash Spanish or Christian disease, depending on who your enemy was. In 1530, the poet and physician Girolamo Fracastoro reflected on a great pox which had been pimpling European penises for several decades in a three-volume treatise called Syphilis Civ Morbus Gallicus, the French disease. It was thus called syphilis and given a mythological origin story. In this tome, Fracastoro writes about a shepherd called Syphilis. <laughs> awesome name. <laughs> Syphilis was tending the sheep of King Alcatus, a mythological Greek character, when he angered the god Apollo by choosing to worship his king instead of the gods. Because Greek gods were overly invested in the intention of mortals, Apollo got pissed and cursed Syphilis with a disfiguring disease. Quote, he first wore buboes, dreadful to the sight, felt strange pains and sleepless past the night. From him, the malady received its name. The neighboring shepherd catched the spreading flame, end quote. In the story, the disease spread quickly, affecting everyone around him, even the king. To mitigate the curse, a trixie, <laughs> yes. is, that, is that a word you made up? It's my favorite word. Trixie to, miti <laughs> to mitigate the curse, a Trixie nymph told the people to sacrifice syphilis and some other things, probably some goats, and then she gave them the guayac tree, whose flowers were used as a treatment for the disease. We'll come back to the guayac tree in a little bit, because though this was just a fabricated Italian physician's tall tale, it actually feeds into a long-standing debate about the origins of the disease. Syphilis is caused by the bacterium Treponema pallidum. It is the only of the Treponema bacterium family to be transmitted through sexual contact. The other manifestations of the bacterium are transmitted through other bodily contact, just like shaking hands kind of bodily contact, um, licking each other, and by sharing <laughs> water vessels. All breathing on each other. Breathing on each other. Rubbing yeah. on each other. Sneezing on each drumping. other. Yes. Um, all of these, uh, all of the diseases in the, in the Treponema bacterium family produce similar, though varyingly horrifying symptoms. Pinta is purely a dermatitis infection, which produces painful papules, usually around the extremities, the neck and the face, and if left untreated, progresses to lesions. Yaws and bedgel also start as painless spots that can progress to painful lesions, but if left untreated, can also attack bones and the soft palate. That straight up sounds like leprosy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, syphilis, like yaws or bejal, starts as a painless sore called a chancre, typically in the rectum, mouth, or on the genitals. But after that, syphilis is one of these diseases that can have really varying symptoms, which is probably one reason why early modern physicians had trouble distinguishing it from other common diseases like leprosy. But today's doctors have mapped five manifestations of the disease. So the first is the, is the painless uh, chancres, which um, you may or may not know you have because sometimes they pop up inside of your rectum or vagina and they don't hurt, so you don't know they're there. You wouldn't know they're there, yeah. Um, these go away after a few weeks and then you are officially infected. Um, syphilis today, of course, is curable at this early stage. Get checked early, and often people, um, with a dose of penicillin. 15th century folks uh, were not so, so lucky because they didn't know about penicillin yet. So those who contracted the venereal form of syphilis were likely to progress through the disease until it killed them. You know, my great-grandfather died of syphilis, right? <gasps> I did know that. But whatever. Was that before or after penicillin? But if he didn't know, if he didn't get it checked. He was born before penicillin, but probably died after penicillin. But I think he, I think he didn't he ever go to the doctor forever. He died in the psych center because right. he went mad. Because once it's in the tertiary stage, you can't cure it anymore. You yeah. Are According to the Mayo Clinic, secondary syphilis starts within a few weeks of the original chancre healing. This stage is much easier to discern because it manifests as a rash that will start around your middle but will eventually spread to your entire body, right down to your palms and the soles of your feet. It might be itchy, it might include genital warts, it might include hair loss, muscle aches, fever, a sore throat, or swollen lymph nodes. The treponema bacterium causes inflammation so that can manifest in myriad ways, depending on the infected person. 
These symptoms might resolve themselves only to come back over the course of an entire year, or they may clear up after a month and progress into latent syphilis, which is when things get really bad. The good news for us is that secondary syphilis is also curable with antibiotics, as long as you catch it while it's still in the early stage. Still bad news for the early moderns. If your infection goes untreated after secondary syphilis sets in, it will go into its latent stage. This is uh, kind of terrifying because latent syphilis has no symptoms. So if you just brushed off your secondary syphilis is like, oh, I got chicken pox again or whatever by accident, um, then you are f um, It is most likely, though, that latent syphilis will just be in you forever without ever manifesting symptoms again. Um, and you'll just be left with the scars from your secondary stage pox. Um, today, in about a third of cases left untreated, syphilis will progress to the tertiary stage. So not all people who have syphilis get to the tertiary stage, but those who do um, will probably die. And two-thirds of them just will carry it forever. Forever. And yeah. just... Just have it. be syphilitic and possibly pass it to, if they're women, pass it to a baby. A baby. Um, again, like the secondary stage, the symptoms will vary from person to person, but the inflammation may attack your brain, your nerves, your eyes, your heart, blood vessels, liver, bones, and or joints. The inflammation will cause tissue to degrade, effectively rotting, sometimes from the inside out and sometimes from the outside in. Some of these symptoms are like those Marissa discussed in her leprosy episode. The flesh rots, and like any other decay, stinks like putrefaction. Um, and I imagine this is like leaving a chicken carcass or a uh, like hamburger packaging in a trash in the middle of July. Like, gross. Like, rotting meat smell. Um, but I'm actually just guessing because I've never encountered anyone with late-stage syphilis myself. If any of you have, let us know. We want to know what syphilis smells, smells like. like. Yeah. Yeah. We like the history of smells. It would be interesting. It would be interesting. And if you have a compare, like if you've ever done that rotting meat in your trash, I've done that. Yeah, let us know if it, that's what it smells like. One time, Pat did a farm to table um, catering gig, and he mm -hmm. cooked in our kitchen, and they just sent him like boxes and boxes of full rabbits, and he had to break down. Oh no! These rabbits. And then we put it all in our garbage, and it was like a day after garbage day. So the rabbit carcasses, you know, after he had broken down the breast off of them or whatever he was yeah. using, sat in there and rotted, and it smelled like a f***ing dead body. Oh. And I was 100% positive that our neighbor thought we had murdered someone, murdered someone because, you know, our garbage can was inside of the garage, and his car was in there, and he was probably like, what the f*** is going oh on? God. It was bad. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> Lots of dead rabbits. Um, anyway, <laughs> one of the more visible signs of tertiary syphilis is the degradation of the soft tissue, like the nose and ears, which may collapse, leaving the infected with breathing and hearing issues until the disease just kills them. Like other venereal diseases, syphilis can also be passed from an infected mother to her baby in utero. Uh, the newborn might not have any symptoms at birth, but may later experience the soft palate and tissue collapse, leaving them deaf or with collapsed noses. Though we, of course, know today that syphilis is transmitted sexually, physicians in the late 15th century did not automatically associate sex with the contraction of the pox, despite its manifestation first on the genitals, but in a roundabout way, some did eventually make the connection and would eventually all come together and say, oh, this is a venereal disease. And as you will see, or as you saw in my leprosy episode, sometimes non-sexually transmitted diseases can be thought to be sexually transmitted diseases yeah. or just associated with sexual misconduct or whatever. So it was like blurry lines. Yes. There's not, there wasn't like, oh, these are STDs. Oh, these are no. other TDs. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> like, it's, it was, it was all gray area. It was all gray area. Yeah. As I, we suggested in that long quote, I read you at the top of the episode from Joe Grunpeck, Early modern European, not Joe, Joseph, whatever, the... Joey, the, Joey Grumpack. The German secretary <laughs> to the Holy Roman Emperor. Guido Grumpack. <laughs> um, your early modern Europeans believe that disease, all disease, was first and foremost God's doing. We're talking about pre-Enlightenment era people in an age when God was all-powerful, the church 
pretty much ran everything and every pestilence and plague, including the plague, you know, the black death itself was issued by God as punishment for human sin and immorality. So within that line of thinking, something like venereal disease could be construed as being linked to immoral behavior, you know, pretty even easily and, and kind of like effectively. Some physicians did contend that the French pox was likely connected to lustful sin because leprosy, having similar symptoms, was already linked to lustfulness. And as Marissa just said, sometimes early modern Europeans thought that leprosy was diffused through sexual contact, hence its categorization as lustful. Right. And there was like, but but some thought that it just caused lust in people who were suffering from it. Mm. And so there was no like, hey, the lust came first and that then no the leprosy. Chickens and eggs. It was all just right. lepers were just meant to be lepers because they're lecherous and yeah. once they're lepers, they're extra lecherous. And like right. it's just right, right. it was a strange sort of like black and white situation. Yeah. Um, as Kevin Sienna notes, quote, in early modern Europe, all diseases were interpreted in providential terms. Outward signs of illness stood for internal moral failure. Yep. The exact, the outside is the exact symbol of, it's an, it's symbolic of what's going on on the inside. Mm -hmm. Early modern Europeans ascribed to the humoral theory of the body. So I went over this in detail in my leprosy episode, which we released a couple of weeks ago. So feel free to zip over to the transcript and get a full breakdown. Um, and I also referenced it, I think, in my original research episode with... Mm. Wet nurses, or um, maybe with the Employment pathology, oh. the pathology episode, perhaps. Maybe. We've talked about it a lot, so we're not going to get into details. But for our purposes here, we'll just we'll cover the basics for those of you who are unfamiliar with those episodes. Central to the humoral theory of the body are the four humors: yellow bile, black bile, blood, and phlegm. Every person had a particular humoral constitution, and a healthy person required the proper balance of their humoral fluids. So after the whole God wills you to be poxed causation theory, early modern Europeans looked at the humoral balance of the body to explain all ailments, temperaments to, and pretty much anything body-related. If it was happening to your body, it's because of the humors. Each of the humors were connected to temperatures and natural elements. Yellow bile was hot and dry. It represented fire and summer. Blood was hot, wet, spring, and represented air. Phlegm was wet, cold, represented water and winter. Black bile was dry, cold, earth, and autumn. So you have to keep these liquids balanced. If you have a fever or other inflammations, doctors would probably diagnose you with an excess of blood and put the leeches to you or cut open your vein. But mostly, they'd recommend changes to your diet and to your exercise habit, or maybe some herbal remedies intended to restore those balances. Early physicians working from this cosmological-slash-medical point of view related the French pox to a range of different causes. According to historian John Arizabalaga, those included divine punishment, corrupted air, Harmful star constellations, uh, duh, yeah. check your horoscope, people, and bad life regimens. Few thought sex was the problem. And actually, because sex was considered a healthful, humorally balancing act, some doctors prescribed having more sex <laughs> it, with a spouse, presumably, to try and restore the health and, and treat the syphilis. Um, so, sorry, wives. Or husbands. Or husbands. You don't know. But probably, probably Probably wives. usually wives. <laughs> yeah. The few who did associate early iterations of the French disease with sex um, are not insignificant, of course. Those who made the connection typically cited the location of the disease's initial manifestations. Um, the Valencian Almanar, for example, rejected the hypothesis that the, that the disease started in the genitals simply because the genitals are hot and stinky. So, duh. So, because that's, he's like, no. If that was the case, then all diseases would start in the genitals if it's just because the genitals are being hot and stinky. No, this is specifically starting in the genitals because of something that the genitals are doing. Right. And there would be, it would sometimes start other places. Like yeast infections happen in the genitals a lot because they're hot and stinky and wet or whatever. Right. But they also can happen in skin folds or right. in armpits or whatever or in your mouth. Right. But like. But this is. This is. Yeah. This is always starting in the genitals. Right. Because it's a sexually transmitted infection. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Um, he and a handful 
of others acknowledged that the disease likely started in the genital region because it was being transmitted via genital to genital contact. Right. Like that these are literally the things that are touching each other. So, um, Others took the lustful theological causations of the disease to their logical conclusion. If the French pox was a cosmological, lustful infection, then surely cause might be lustful acts. This, as we'll actually get into in Abe's next episode as part of our upcoming sex series, was important in shaping the way that syphilis was gendered. Women, particularly but not only women who sold sex, were often saddled with the responsibility of spreading syphilis. <laughs> with the responsibility. <laughs> Maybe more like saddled with the culpability yeah, for yeah, spreading yeah. syphilis. Humoral doctors said that the womb, cold and dry, was less susceptible to the effects of syphilis but could carry it and then infect tons of men before being affected itself. So kind of like that um, typhoid Mary situation. Yeah. Right. All the poor penises, being hot and wet, were very sensitive to getting the pox and would get it the very first time it brushed against a poxy vulva. And it's crazy because it's probably the opposite, yeah. right? That women are way more so vulnerable to... At least that's the case with most STDs. Yeah. That, that it's men can... You can sometimes... Just because their um, mucous membranes are more often on the inside and stuff. And also probably... Like, you wouldn't be, you, you would be less likely to catch it if you're a woman because you would get that initial rash inside of you. Whereas you'd men would not, get it. So you're more likely to catch it, but less likely to notice it, is right, what you're saying. Because right, right, you right. said less likely to catch it. But I mean, you, I know what you meant. Like, yeah, less likely to notice that to it To notice happened. That, that it happened. Whereas right. a penis is outside the body. And also, the penis fleshes out things that go into it right. when you ejaculate and then yeah. you pull out and then you like walk away so you're all a lot of times you know you're slightly protected by those barriers yeah. and then women it's like I, I am here to receive your disease like yeah. that's the only Basically. yeah yeah Ugh. um so early physicians argued for decades about what the great pox was how it was caused, and made all kinds of largely ineffective recommendations about how to treat it, including, as we said, having more sex. By the turn of the century, though, most agreed that it was venereal, the 16th century, that is. Um, most agreed that it was venereal and recommended washing genitals with abrasive powders, wiping them down with a clean linen shirt or cloth, but not the shirt or cloth of the poxy woman you just had sex with, um, or hot water or white wine being poured what over. What a waste of wine. Yeah, well. <laughs> I wasn't really sure if it was hot white wine. Maybe it was. No, I don't know, maybe. Or just white wine. I mean, it's like vinegar, so, yeah, same thing. Um, these uh, innovations, or medicines, would be the primary preventatives for the next 300 years, which is where we'll get horrific stories of women washing their vaginas out with acidic solutions, like uh, women who sold sex. Chlorinated Being, bleach. Yeah, yeah. Bleaching vaginas after having sex to try and prevent STDs. <clears throat> um, but either way... The prevalence of syphilis really freaked Europeans out in starting in the 1490s and, you know, going all the way to the 20th century, really. There is tons of literature, artwork, and other cultural products that reflect the anxiety syphilis created among Europeans. We've got so much to cover. Um, we'll only discuss a couple of Shakespearean examples before we move on to uh, the origins debate that I've promised you. The great origin <laughs> debate. Um, because... That's sort of the crux of this episode. But once you think about all the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th century literature you've read in your lifetime, you'll probably start to realize just how widespread the, quote, French pox became in popular imagination as a marker of immorality, depravity, decay, sin, or womanly guiles. It's kind of everywhere. Yeah, it yeah. really is. Shakespeare mentioned the pox in 55 lines of Measure for Measure, 61 lines in Troilus and Cressida, and 67 lines in Timon of Athens. It was even the inspiration for a couple of sonnets. Sonnet 55, The Canker, quipped, quote, The expense of spirit and a waste of shame is lust in action and still action, end quote. By the time he wrote Henry V, it was almost a staple of his world building. The character Pistol returns home from war, opens a brothel, while disguising his syphilitic sores as war wounds. 
Quote, honor is cudgeled, well bawd. I'll turn and something lean to cut purse of quick. Hand to England will I steal, and there I'll steal. And patches I will get unto these cuddled scars, and swear I got them in the Gallia Wars. <laughs> End quote. I said wars Neither. that way, because yeah. so it rhymed. Get so it? So it rhymed, because <laughs> that's how they would have done it. In the six, seven, 17th century? Si- 16th? 16th century, yeah. He's the 1500s? Yes. Oh, okay. Generally, Shakespeare perpetuated the pox's popular association with France. Even the fanciful Midsummer Night's Dream is marred by the disease. One character observes, some of your French crowns have no hair at all. Le Chapelet was the French term for the syphilitic lesions of the forehead that looked a little bit like a crown. Um, And this condition is mentioned again in Measure for Measure, Comedy of Errors, and Pericles. You can picture it in the background like, doom doom, because it's like supposed to be a joke. So the references are numerous. There are a couple of good, short analyses of Shakespearean syphilis, but go back to your favorite plays and see if you can't find some allusions yourself. We'd love you to share them with us. Post the weirdest, grossest, or sassiest Shakespeare syphilitic quote in our pod squad group. That would be great. Right? I love syphilitic quotes. Just my favorite. They are great. (laughs) And also syphilitic smells, maybe. (laughs) Though we have a pretty solid sense of how early modern Europeans reacted to, treated, and moralized about syphilis in the first decades of its proliferation, we don't really definitively know where syphilis started. And here we get to the great origin (laughs) debate. Though this is a question scholars have been pondering for centuries, the most recent scholarship that I could dig up on the subject still admits that there are several plausible hypotheses on the origin. All three make some connection to contact between Europeans and Americans in the 15th century, hinging on whether that contact was responsible for the proliferation of syphilis or if that contact had absolutely nothing to do with the disease manifesting suddenly and unrelatedly at that moment. The three major hypotheses are known as the pre-Columbian, the Columbian, and the Unitarian. (laughs) It's like... Three different kinds of churches. <laughs> the yes. pre-Columbian, the Columbian, and the Unitarian. So the pre-Columbian thesis argues that the treponemal bacteria was present on both sides of the Atlantic before Columbus and his successors started ferrying disease back and forth, but that venereal syphilis developed specifically in Europe and then was carried by Europeans to the Americas. So pre-Columbian just means that syphilis didn't start ravaging Europe because Columbus sailed the ocean blue. It's suggested that things just got bad around the same time, perhaps 30 plus years before. This thesis is pretty unpopular now since new skeletal studies support different hypotheses. According to some of the scholars who've put forward this pre-Columbian thesis, the treponema bacterium mutates when introduced to different climates. Arid climates, for example, will cause the pinta strain of the bacterium to mutate into yaws. Pinta, a skin disease, was first contracted by humans in Southwest Asia who came into contact with bacterium-carrying primates about fifteen to 17,000 years ago. Because a land bridge connected Asia to the Americas until about 11,000 years ago, nomadic humans would have carried that strain of the bacterium into the Americas with them. Yaws, a mutation of Pinta, developed first in Central and Western Africa around 9,000 years ago as a result of climate change, which made that region more arid. And there's a Yaws-like or maybe even a specifically Yaws strain of the bacteria that develops also in, um, in Central America. Archaeologists have identified skeletons with evidence of Yaws in the Americas, which suggests that American regions that experienced similar aridization 9,000 years ago likely also saw Pinta mutate into Yaws. So Southwest Asia and the land bridge that would have gone to like Alaska. Yes. Um, the mut- the same so what you're saying is the same mutation or the same aridization happened in southwest asia as happened in the mm-hmm. americas oh central and south central and west africa aridization okay like desert right yeah and then that same thing is happening probably in like north america great plains area slash mexico so the same equatorial yeah. area okay okay yeah. i yeah. get what you mean and it's mutating this pinta bacterium into um, this yaws thing, and the crazy thing is that there's there is this um, DNA 
uh, analysis of the bacteria itself. Mm -hmm. So, and then there's also the fact that as humans, we're constantly evolving Mm -hmm. and our immune systems probably act differently than they did at the time. So even if you took me or you, even before any vaccines or anything, and just put us 500 years ago, we would die. We, it would be, or maybe not, maybe we would, right. So like there's, there's so many factors to account for. It's like ridiculous. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Yeah. So according to these scholars, then, when Europeans started encountering the disease through contact with Central and West Africans in trade and then through large-scale enslavement of infected peoples, they carried the disease back to Western Europe with them. Yaws remained yaws in regions with similar climates, but would have mutated into different kinds of syphilis in colder and drier climates. It became Bejel or endemic syphilis in places with poor hygiene. Like yaws or pinta, bejel is transmitted through bodily contact, not necessarily sex. In places with relative good hygiene, where the bacterium is not permitted to take root in the skin, it would have evolved into the venereal disease that we're talking about today, regular old syphilis. On the other side of this coin is the Columbian hypothesis, which is apparently very popular and argues that Columbus and his goons contracted syphilis in the Americas and carried it back to Europe. This thesis is staked in part on 15th and 16th century medical texts that mapped the explosion of the disease in Italy, France, and Spain in the immediate years after Columbus returned from the Americas. Other scholars have challenged this evidence because it may also reflect a shift in the medical community, which was paying more attention to classifying diseases more generally in the late 15th century. Right. Yes. Venereal syphilis shares many symptoms with leprosy, for example, so it is possible that there simply wasn't an effort to differentiate between these generalizable diseases. And I wonder, too, if... If anyone has considered, I think they're called paleopathologists who yeah. study. So I wonder if any of them have considered oh, have. the possibility. Oh. Well, maybe you've read this, that that there was a different disease, that they not syphilis, that they brought back from the Americas that made people more vulnerable to syphilis. Like, yeah, you know what I mean? You yeah. know, like, well, like yes. so that syphilis being the secondary disease. Yes. Do they think that? Yeah. Do you say that? Yeah, we'll okay. get there. I'm smart. That's the Unitarian. The Unitarian. I can't wait. (laughs) In the 1990s, paleopathologists Bruce and Christine Rothschild examined collections of skeletons from several sites around the globe. They first examined skeletal remains with confirmed cases of syphilis, beagles, and yaws. Then they examined 687 skeletons from archaeological sites in the United States and Ecuador. They found that populations in the South, so like modern day in New Mexico, Florida, and Ecuador, had syphilis, while those in the North, modern day Ohio, Illinois, and Virginia, had yaws. By contrast, examination of 1,000 old world skeletons dated to before contact with the Americas revealed no cases of syphilis. Bam! For the first, I'm like, just like one thousand of millions of. I, I know, but I'm just I, saying. I don't like it, but anyway, I I don't like it. <laughs> for um, for the Rothschilds, that that just it just makes it less likely that it started there. Maybe. For the Rothschilds, this suggests that syphilis was first present in the Americas and that it was a mutation of American yaws. Then it was contracted by Columbus and his crew and carried back to Europe. The most recent thesis is the Unitarian thesis, or the modified Columbian hypothesis, which pieces together data from both the Columbian and pre-Columbian studies. This builds off of the Rothschild's work studying skeletons from both sides of the Atlantic and goes a step further to suggest that what we know as syphilis today did not exist until the European, African, and American strains of the Treponema bacterium collided in those first years of contact, facilitated by the early Atlantic slave trade and the Spanish encounters with the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Studies conducted by forensic anthropologists and paleopathologists have identified the symptoms of various strains of the Treponema bacterium in pre-Columbian American and Eurasian and African skeletons. There is ample genetic evidence to show that early strains of the treponemal diseases, particularly Pinta and Yaws, existed everywhere, both before and after Columbus made it to the Caribbean. It would have mutated and changed in those isolated settings in divergent but similar ways. 
That's interesting, though. Mm-hmm. Now I almost want to assign this episode for my class when I talk about early versions of globalization. Yes. Like, oh I, ta- I talk about populating Oceania, but, like, this would also be good. There is skeletal evidence. Can I say skeletal? As if I'm British, that would be awesome, right? Yeah. <laughs> I just f***ing love that. Skeletal. The skeletal remains. Okay, so more importantly, on the America's side of the Atlantic, there's skeletal evidence of a high prevalence of treponemal disease paired with a low age of infection and an apparent absence of lesions attributable to congenital syphilis. So there's young people who are dying of syphilis, but they don't have congenital syphilis. Right. What's going on? Mm -hmm. So according to Molly Zuckerman, Associate Professor of Biological Anthropology at Mississippi State University, quote, this suggests that a non-venereal form of syphilis similar to modern-day yaws or beetle, one not passed through the placenta, was present at the time. Mm -hmm. So something akin to the syphilis that would rage through Europe pre-existed in the Americas. This is supported in part by the historical record as well as the biological one. The indigenous peoples that the Spanish encountered in the Caribbean were already familiar with treatments for the symptoms of syphilis, which could prove effective on the European disease that took root in the 1490s. The Gaiacum, for example, which appeared as a cure uh, proffered by the lovely nymph of Girolamo Fracastoro's poem naming syphilis, is native to the tropical Americas. The word Gaiacum is derived from the Taino word for the flowering plant. The Taino lived before being wiped out by the Spanish conquistadors and disease in the Bahamas and obviously introduced Europeans to the medicinal uses of the plant before they were largely decimated by enslavement and European diseases. We mentioned the Tainos in the um, Haitian Revolution episode. Yes. So what this hybrid theory postulates is the idea that Columbus and his crew encountered a unique strain of the Treponema bacterium, which had developed in the biomes of indigenous Americans without interference from the Eurasians or Africans for millennia. Those conquistadors transported that non-venereal infection back to Europe, um, possibly with the people they took captive because they did that, right? They took natives and were like brought them back to the king of Spain and said, look at these exotic people I stole. Right. Um, and the English did that too. Right. Yeah. Which, according to Zuckerman, quote, could have responded to dramatic, so this disease could have tr- responded to dramatically different selection pressures with a new sexual transmission strategy, end quote. That means that like the Pinta's, Pinta to Yaw's development in the aridization of Central and West Africa, the American disease could have adapted itself into a sexually transmitted infection with extreme side effects. While there were certainly great cities in the Americas in the 15th century, urbanization there was nothing compared to that of early modern Europe. And according to this hypothesis then, syphilis was created by the introduction of an American strain of the Tryponema bacterium to the climate and conditions of early modern Europe. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. So the disease wanting to continue to live was like, now I'm going to become an STD. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, not awesome, but it's so interesting. And then that explains why people in the Americas could get European-style syphilis because yeah. once people ha- got it – once it had been morphed by the European climate, yeah. they wouldn't be used to that climate. They wouldn't be used to that strain. They're right. not used to that new strategy exactly. of that bacteria. That's awesome. Yeah. That's fucking cool. So as Mark Rose points out, historians have found complicating evidence in the writings of pre-Columbian European people to suggest that syphilis did exist in Europe prior to 1492. While ancient Greek and Roman authors were rarely specific enough to be certain, and it's problematic to apply more recent diagnoses on diseases of the past, it's important not to discount any one of these hypotheses entirely. Crusaders brought, quote, Saracen ointment back from the Middle East, a medicine that contained mercury for treating lepers. Mercury wasn't actually an effective medication for leprosy, but was a very popular treatment for syphilis well into the 19th century. 13th and 14th century AD references to venereal leprosy may also indicate syphilis because leprosy isn't sexually transmitted and syphilis is similar and has Mm -hmm. similar symptoms. That European physicians didn't start describing syphilis as syphilis until the 16th century does not mean that it didn't exist. So while biological anthropologists and other scientists 
have studied a thousand or even several thousand skeletons and found no signs of syphilis before Columbus's voyage, um, this isn't evidence that it wasn't there. So as I noted in my episode on leprosy, hundreds of thousands of people with leprosy were buried in cemeteries near um, leper hospitals. And because many of the manifestations of syphilis resemble leprosy, it's very possible that among those unstudied skeletons are syphilitic victims. And of the leper cemeteries that have been excavated, they've noted that about 70 to 80 percent of the skeletons um, have classic signs of leprosy, but but, you know, 20 to 30 percent do not. Mm. And so they think either somebody they were misdiagnosed Mm -hmm. or possibly they had the lesser version of leprosy. There's two different versions and one's kind of like no big deal. Yeah. Or um they could have had a different disfiguring disease altogether, one yeah. that doesn't have the same classical symptoms on skeletal remains. Yeah. So it's totally possible that a bunch of them could have had syphilis. Right. Okay. So, and I wanted to just introduce this because while I really like the Unitarian, whatever, the the modified um, Columbian thesis, I think it's also, you know, that there are things beyond the sample of scientific data that's being presented as part of the thesis that complicate this narrative. Like there very well Mm -hmm. could have been syphilis, the syphilis, but it still could have, still could have uh, changed with the merging of the American strain, right? Mm -hmm. With the existing syphilis in the America or in Europe. Right. And right. Just because the idea, I, the, the disease wasn't identified as such. Right. That actual bacteria, the uh, great grandfathers of of the current <laughs> syphilis bacteria. Yeah. The ancestors of the current. <laughs> I don't know if that's how it's called. Do they have a, a family tree? They yeah, probably. they probably have a family tree. So the ancestors of current syphilis bacteria could have been present and called something, you know, yeah. just called scabies or whatever. Yeah. 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 That's that's one of the hardest parts of the history of medicine is. Is not projecting our post uh, germ theory right. ideas about medicine on earlier peoples who yeah. had no conception of germs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. And I'm not a scientist, obviously, and I don't have access to any of the data, the like raw data that Molly Zuckerman or even the Rothschilds were basing their conclusions. But I also have to wonder how quick these hard scientists are to dismiss the historical record or the fallibility of their own interpretation of data. In 1997, a French scholar concluded that a fourth century fetus exhibited the symptoms of congenital syphilis. Bruce Rothschild dismissed the French scholar's interpretation, preferring his own interpretation instead. Of course, a fourth century fetus with congenital syphilis would have been one data point to destroy his career-making Columbian thesis. But still, his examination of the skeletal remains produced different results. Quote, The character of the pathology appeared to me to be calcified membranes or tissues rather than periosteal reaction, he says. The skull lesions are unlike those of treponemal disease, i.e. congenital syphilis. The dramatic forearm calcification is unlike anything we have previously witnessed in over 500 cases of adult syphilis, nor in the periosteal reaction that characterizes yaws and bejal, disorders in which children, although probably not fetuses, are frequently affected. So he's like, it's wrong. I don't know what it is, but it's not this. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I hate when people tear something apart without suggesting, you know, a hypothesis to replace it. Right. It's like, that's not helpful. So while we have no concrete answer to the origin of syphilis, we do have lots of documentation about what the English called the French pox and what the French called the Neapolitan pox. The Russians called the Polish disease, the Poles called the German disease, and the Turks called the Christian disease. Because we, meaning me and Averill, but probably also Anglo-Americans more generally, rely primarily on English language sources, we are more accustomed to hearing it called the French disease more than anything else. The Italians, Germans, and British all referred to it as the French disease at some point, as well as the great pox, the pox disease, pustule, the bad pox, bad verrucae, the disease of Tavel, among many other descriptive titles. 
Presumably, this assignation of blame mostly centered on rivalry. The French were frequently at war with English, German, or Italian enemies throughout the early modern period and beyond. Because, <laughs> like, forever they've been doing that. Yes. I mean, everyone has everyone. been doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but undoubtedly, the shoe fit, as it were, because the first major documented outbreak of the Great Pox was among French troops who laid siege to Naples from 1494 to 1495. As you'll recall from fifth grade social studies, Christopher Columbus was probably Genoese, maybe Spanish. His family mausoleum is in Seville, so that's very strange. But the 87 men who made up the crew of his three ships that sailed to the Americas were mostly Spaniards. Believing that the infection made its way from either Lisbon or Barcelona, where they touched down in March. I think you have to say it, Barcelona. Barcelona. <laughs> Or Barcelona, <laughs> in March 1493 um, to Naples, Italy, by February of 1495, when Charles VIII and his troops arrived at the city with the intention to siege it into submission. All that is not that far-fetched, I guess. You know, two years is plenty of time for a disease to wiggle its way across the Mediterranean. Yeah, and people got around a lot more than, yeah. than we realized yeah. in the early modern period. It was a time of intense mobility. Yes. And people... Don't necessarily know that. Right. Charles marched with 25,000 men, mercenaries from all over Europe, because, you know, you were often professional paid soldiers in these wars um, of, of conquest in, in Europe. So um, and his mercenaries came from all over, including Spain and Germany and oh, France. You should go to our military revolution episode where I talk about the professionalization of soldiers. hey <laughs> There you go. Um, so his troops could have very well included as well, you know, men who had encountered Columbus's crew. Maybe, I don't know, maybe even some of his, of his crew were there. I don't know. Um, so Charles marched with his 25,000 men uh, through the Italian peninsula, and Naples had only a defense of about 1,000 troops, so um, also mercenaries, including Spanish men. And it's possible that the new pox traveled on the genitals of Spanish mercenaries. Naples was taken easily, and according to the histories, the pox decimated Charles VIII's troops. Though this incident is usually cited as evidence for the Columbian thesis, we should also point out that this is merely the first documented outbreak. That doesn't mean the disease didn't exist in some lesser form in Europe before the Italian War. And actually, I searched high and low for the sources that documented the effects of the disease among French troops. I did find a footnote in Matthew Smallman Rayner's War Epidemics that says, quote, the source of the disease among the French army in Naples is entirely uncertain. According to Garrison, 1917, syphilis is supposed to have been communicated to the French soldiers by the Spanish occupants of the city. The latter, in turn, contracted the disease from sailors who had returned from the New World with Christopher Columbus. As noted by Creighton, however, there is evidence that the disease may have been present in France before the war with the Italians, and the French forces may have conveyed the disease to Nigeria. In summarizing the conflicting evidence, Creighton observes, We have a theory of a Spanish origin, of a French origin, and also perhaps of a native Italian origin, all agreeing that Italy, during the state of war from 1494 to 1496, was the theater of its first ravages on the great scale and the source from which the disease was brought to all the countries of Europe by the returning soldiery. So those who survived the first rounds of incubation, as it was sort of passed around the, the troops and the people of the city in, in Naples, um, apparently returned to their homes with enough time to then pass on the disease far and wide before they succumbed to it. Because again, that latent stage can last for years and then you can present the more horrifying symptoms much, much later in life. Right. It was just like the perfect storm. Yes. All of these different nations fighting each other and hiring mercenaries from a country that just came back from the New World. Like, yeah. you know, it's just sort of like... I was re looking for, like, I wanted to see descriptions of the symptoms that the soldiers presented because I was wondering everyone's like freaking out about this moment that this pox outbreaks but if it was just the pimples you know like the the mumps or whatever the measles why were they like this is the worst thing that's ever happened I would be more 
freaked Maybe out. they weren't, but it's just been built up yeah, over, time over time as, yeah. oh, well, like, you know, a historian, a Victorian historian was probably, like, found some reference to mm. some pimple penis outbreak or whatever. Yeah. And then he's like, this is where the syphilis started. And yeah. then it becomes a thing. Wanna, Basically, we're all that. recovering from Victorian historians, like... Ruining everything. Ruining, yeah, like, messing everything up. Yeah. We can't... It's really hard to get over that narrative. Because the... I mean, the real horror is what syphilis tertiary syphilis turned Mm -hmm. into right like the decay of the body right yeah documented outbreaks cropped up in france and germany in early 1495 during the italian wars um switzerland was hit later in 1495 after the italian wars ended the pox popped up in holland and greece in 1496 it's somewhat surprising that it took that long considering greece's proximity to italy apparently the breeding ground of the disease um, purportedly, at yeah. least. Um, in England and Scotland in 1497, and in Hungary, Russia, and Poland in 1499. Europeans ultimately spread the great pox to the rest of the world. The first recorded case in India cropped up in 1498 through Indian contact with Portuguese traders. The Portuguese also carried it to East Asia and West Africa, merchants and sailors making landfall at various ports along the African coast. Can I just say... Think about how much boning that is. Yeah. Like, we're not talking about, oh, we we um, exchanged some money and now you have syphilis. <laughs> no. This yeah. is straight up having sex in brothels with local women. Yeah. Probably with other men, too, sometimes. Yeah. Like, you know. Well, you have to think, like, the sailors are on the ship, so they're probably having sex with at least a few of each other on the ships. Right. And that's spreading the disease. Yeah. You know, syphilis in the in the Navy, in all navies, is like a real problem. Mm-hmm. And then by the time they get off, the ones who were like, well, I'm still really horny and I've been at sea for a long time and that my one guy I usually have sex with won't have sex with me because I have pockmarks on my penis. Mm-hmm. He has to go in and diddle a woman who sells sex. Makes yeah. a lot of sense. It, it's it's not surprising that it travels so quickly via sea routes. Maybe that's why it took longer to get from Italy to Greece because you know you would like walk there mm-hmm. and and go through like Anatolia or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting, huh? Um, oh. So in about five years, the disease was being documented in just about every European country, and then every African and Asian country with which the Europeans came into contact. As those early physicians tried to grapple with the disease, sometimes in conversation, but also too often in intellectual isolation, it took a great deal of trial and error to develop effective preventative measures and treatments. Understanding the venereal transmission was first and foremost in this journey, but prevention was much harder. There are scholars who have suggested that the anxiety the great pox created in Europeans contributed to religious puritanism, Policing of sex and sexuality, which really sort of expanded in the uh, 16th century, and even witch hunts. Um, Now, saying that syphilis created religious conservatism is an overstatement for sure. But it can surely be understood as part of a larger confluence of events that prompted the reshaping of the early modern world starting in 1500. Kevin Siena notes that though early iterations of condoms were being created in the 16th century, few thought to use them to prevent venereal disease transmission. And, fun fact, condom from the Latin condo, to sheath, preserve, or thrust into. Use it, or very possibly lose it. In debunking some of the less credible and highly popular theories about the origins of syphilis, Molly Zuckerman discusses the danger of popularizing unverified data and opinions in media like documentaries and popular magazines. One key point of this article they take issue with is accusation of the moralizing of the origin story debate. As we already suggested, these authors, including Molly Zuckerman, take offense at the idea that they, pure objective scientists, would be investigating this issue and proffering results to make a moral argument. While I've already expressed my annoyance with this typical scientist point of view, they do at least admit that something like syphilis can be and is morally charged. That is illustrated with no finer a point than a woodcut from Germany in the 15th century that literally moralizes the spread of syphilis. As the authors note, quote, This illustration shows a closed community of syphilitics, three male and one female, being punished by the flagellum day, the whip of God. 
for their sexual transgressions. The arrows emanating from the hands of Jesus function as agents of infection and signify the martyrdom of the victims who suffer as a consequence of the fall from Eden. Later reworkings of this illustration place more emphasis on the male sufferer, emphasizing that he and thus men overall are the true victims here, whereas women through their sin are to blame for the illness. The black spots or blatterns or blisters on their faces symbolize infection with the disease now known as syphilis and are an indicator of moral blight, end quote. That's how Damn. I end my episode. <laughs> that no, that's my episodes. My episodes are good. So I wanted to end with this story because this will segue nicely into my follow up episode in the sex series on again the way that the disease becomes gendered and how women be- bear the brunt of um, of trying to prevent it and treat it and deal with it, um, particularly in the 19th century, but I actually also have an article from the 16th century where they just started locking up beautiful women in asylums and like hospitals to prevent them from possibly creating lustful desire and spreading the disease more. They mm-hmm. didn't have syphilis, but they might get syphilis because they were too pretty. Right. So that's going to be the next episode. You can look forward to that in a, in a couple, you know, weeks. Favorite favorite thesis? Hybrid thesis, obviously. Mm-hmm. I like the idea that that the disease was like, I'm not working anymore. I'm changing strategies and becoming an STD. That's it awesome. It has a personality. That's awesome. Yeah. It, they do. They have personalities and they have ancestors, apparently. Yes. <laughs> Normally I, you know, I go from the angle of, I don't know, exploration. I talk about Zheng He and how Chinese exploration compares to European exploration. but The I'm great divergence. Yeah. But now you can talk about the great origin debate. <laughs> the great origin <laughs> debate of syphilis. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of awesome. Yeah. But also it's just amazing because you don't think of historical figures as like people who have sex and yeah. like sexual desires and yeah. like want to get it on. And it, it's pretty obvious that yeah. there was a lot of sex going on all the time. Yes. Um, the fact that this was spreading. And there is now, too. There's a lot of sex going on all the time throughout yeah. all of history forever and ever. Right. Um, I also have a little confession. That's what I take away from this. <laughs> I have a confession. Um, none of the science studies that I read actually reference specifically the Atlantic slave trade and the you know, importation of enslaved peoples from West Africa mm-hmm. or Central Africa as part of this morphology of the, the, the disease. I just make that assumption myself because, in part, those people were also somewhat isolated because of the Sahara, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we already know that Europeans couldn't cope with most of the diseases that were within the interior of West Africa and Central Africa. So... I'm assuming that there, that's like it's the confluence of all three populations in mm-hmm. this in this Colombian exchange um, that is creating this. But really, disease. most Africans and Eurasians they had much more similar um, immune disease. Yeah, you know, like right there was more comparable more contact. So certainly, the American version was the most isolated and would have had would have probably had the greatest impact. But I think there's probably also something to... Like, who's, who's to say that it wasn't an enslaved person on Columbus's ship who was also part of the um, transmission strategy was for the disease? Was there slaves on Columbus's ship? I don't know. I don't think there was. There wasn't? Just the 87 Spaniards? There were some <laughs> convicts. There were four convicts. Okay. I googled that. Oh, yeah, that's another thing. The whole penal colony situation. People started... Con- yeah, that's... Wow. Yeah, but once again, it doesn't really matter. I no. mean, it, it matters. It's interesting to talk about, yeah. but it doesn't... It doesn't change the fact that, it ha- you know, there is syphilis, and then that was something that people had to deal with for right hundreds of years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Before we wrap up, I just wanted to uh, say that I had to read through a lot of medical journals and jargon to write this episode. And while I'm, you know, a relatively smart person, I'm not a biologist or a medical doctor, so I have some may have some technical stuff wrong. Sorry if that's the case. And feel free to write in with all of your medical expertise, as long as your medical expertise is not from Dr. Oz or WebMD, because I too know how to Google. Um, I tried to synthesize the medicalese into something that was podcastable. 
That said, and on a completely different note, I will repeat that I am not a medical doctor. So for the love of God, do not send us pictures of spots or oddities on your body that you want diagnosed. And neither of us have the expertise or the desire to I mean, see you can send things. us the pictures. I'm always down. But, I'm not. But I'm not going to give you a diagnosis. Yeah. Um, if something looks or feels weird, please consult your actual physician. We will accept, however, your artistic rep- responses to the material of this, of this episode. If you want to sculpt us epoxy penis or create an abstract velvet painting of tertiary syphilis, we will take that um, in all of its glory. Look for um, our follow-up episode on women who sold sex and forced institutionalization coming with our sex series. Um, That's the second half of this story of syphilis. Yeah. In the meantime, share your favorite syphilitic Shakespeare or other 16th, 17th, 18th century masterpieces with us by joining the Dig Pod Squad on Facebook. You can also quip your favorite quotes on Twitter, follow us, and tag us at dig underscore history. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Uh, help us reach new listeners. Leave us a rating or a review or and a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Play or wherever you are listening. As always, you can find the complete transcript and bibliography for this episode at digpodcast.org. Bye. Bye! This podcast was produced by the historians of Dig, Elizabeth Garner Masaryk, Sarah Hanley Cousins, Marissa Rhodes, and me, Avril Earls. Air is it air air is a little Air does a generally say uh, generally Shakespeare in Troilus and Cressida. So how do you say that? I say Cressida. Cress- I think it is Cressida. A mythological. What's wrong with my voice? Musical interlude. Commercial. <laughs> Yaws and Beagle. 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 Uh. Bagel. 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 There we go. By the time he wrote Henry V, Henry V, should I say the fifth? I don't know. Yeah, yes. Henry V. I know, it's just, it's th- it doesn't say that. World, oh, world business. Oh my God. That, you, need a, you need a dash. Sorry. <laughs> of his world building. So if you're not using an adverb, which has an L and Y at the end, you have to do a dash. Okay. I'm telling Devitt on you. Or I'm well, telling <laughs> I wrote this at 11 o'clock. Time, so. so. <laughs> The Taino lived before being wiped out by the Spanish conquistadors and disease on the Bahamas. On the Bahamas. That's not how you say that. In the Bahamas. It's an island, though. You You would say on the Bahamanian islands, but you can't. Okay. (laughs) Fine. On the Bahamas. I think it sounds better. That sounds, that's like how Noble talks. On the Bahamas. I'm horrible at knowing how you are writing. What are you doing? Took my towel. Oh. Wash your towel. You're gonna shower in the background of our episode? Yeah, we're like. You can't hear that, can you? Yes. Yeah. We yeah. can hear you You're... typing downstairs. Your shower is very loud. You can't wait. Here, let's just close the door. Yeah. That'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be like white noise in the background of things. <sighs> Alright, where were we going? Pre Columbian. <laughs>